Hello, uh, my name is Milton Yarberry. I'm a director of medical programs at ICS. Um, today I'll be talking about accelerating medical device software development with good UX practice. Before I start, uh, a quick description of my company, ICS, um, also known as Boston UX. Uh, we're a company in, uh, uh, near Boston. Um, we're about 120 employees. Um, we have offices also in the Bay Area and in Ottawa. We're basically a full stack software development company. Um, we start with the user interface. We go down to the application development to the embedded OS um, and uh, uh, et cetera. So we, we do have a dedicated UX design service, services team and uh, we basically do end-to-end -end product realization with uh, an emphasis on QT and QT training for platform independence. So uh, today we'll be speaking about uh, the FDA and the uh, invention of the use error um, the uh, UX design basics and its uh, mapping into 62366, uh, as well as uh, methods for bridging the gap between uh, UX and software development. Um, the common theme here really is that um, use errors and risk-based UX design um, can actually help you with your product development. It can actually uh, accelerate it. So um, if you were a medical device manufacturer before 1995, um, it was common to uh, have uh, errors made with your device, uh, effectively blamed on the user. The user made an error with your device. The user error, um, it, it would cover you know, categories of issues around things like, uh, oh, well, there's a lapse of attention. Um, uh, it, there, a person made a mental error in terms of choosing the wrong selection or, or entering the wrong information. Um, it would cover elements even like insufficient training. Somebody who didn't have the uh, prerequisite training and yet are in a hospital using a device with, without having that training. Um, as well as um, things like visibility, like uh, you know, expecting somebody to have a certain level of eyesight to be a certain proximity to your device, that sort of thing. Um, the common element here is that the focus is on the user, um, not the device, implying that the user, in the fact, is, in, is accountable. Also, what's implied here that's kind of interesting is that the notion that's embedded is that it's an isolated event. This is not a uh, systemic um, cause underlying this. This is something having to do with uh, something that happens as a one-off and that uh, uh, wouldn't be expected to happen uh, repeatedly. So that story changed uh, in 1995. If you're a medical device manufacturer post-1995, uh, you would know that a, uh, the term use error uh, is coined. Um, so use instead of user um, error sort of flips the thinking. Um, it, it, uh, it, it inverts uh, who's to blame, basically, in this, uh, in this scenario. Um, so things like uh, the user misread the display um, instead would become a device problem, such as the device is difficult to see, uh, and that would refer to like font size, display backlight, that sort of thing. Um, whereas old uh, pre-1995 mental errors uh, would become the device is confusing to use. Uh, insufficient training might become the device is not intuitive. Lapse of attention might be uh, the device doesn't account for cognitive load of the user. So um, the use versus user paradigm, use error uh, is where the user interface and the, and, and the device itself has design flaws that contribute to users making errors versus a user error is where you blame it on the user implying that it's their accountability. So the burden at this point, post-1995, is on the device instead of the user. To get a sense for like how applicable or how broad a category of use error um, uh, is, I would go to the definition. Um, so taking something from 14971, um, an act or a mission that results in a, a different medical device response than intended by the manufacturer 
or is expected by the user. So pretty much says if it does anything I don't like, um, you know, that's a use error. And that's, frankly, it's, it's pretty all-encompassing. Um, also a quote from 62366, uh, the use errors are the direct result of poor user interface design. So it really sort of points the, fi the finger at user interface developers and uh, the device itself. So the t there's a tie-in to safe and effective. Safe and effective use of a medical device means that users do not make errors that lead to injury, and they achieved the desired medical treatment. If a safe and effective use is not achieved, use error has occurred. So this is really bringing the, this, this sort of abstract definition into the whole risk for um, uh, safe and effective medical devices. So it sort of prompts the question, um, you know, how do we target use errors? Um, so how do we systematically reduce them in, in a medical device design? And it basically goes back to sort of the ABCs, you know, um, the, the ISO 14971, which is the risk management um, standard, um, but now it's largely applied in IEC 62366 same process just applied to the user interface, um, that's the method for targeting use errors. So just to make this a little more explicit, um, so systematically targeting use errors kind of breaks down into, in my mind, three steps here. Um, the flowchart on the right is excerpted from 62366. Uh, they're the process that they expect. I believe it's in Section 5, or at least it's detailed there. Um, but simplifying this, the three steps I would use to describe this is, you know, step one, uh, define the use and analyze the hazards. So um, you take a look at the user, you take a look at the environment, you take a look at uh, the cognitive load on that user, uh, and you conjugate a list of uh, what uh, things that could happen that would be, uh, could result in a negative outcome. Step two would be, okay, you propose solutions and you prototype those solutions. And step three would simply be, oh great, now have a study and evaluate how those solutions performed. So given that process, how does this get us to um, the development side of the equation? So, uh, how do we use UX to sort of feed regulatory development? Uh, in this diagram, I've sort of partitioned um, the activities into two spaces. The one on the left is stuff that would be done as part of 62366. So that's basically de-risking your user interface. It's useful if you can do all of this under the, um, the conditions of a prototype, which, is, which is, is fair to do. At this point, you're pretty much just doing research against your target market um, and, and you're testing the outcomes of those research. Uh, you haven't quite written the product requirements. You definitely haven't signed them as to like the first release version yet. Um, but the steps in this space are define and analyze, rapid software prototyping, and formative studies, just like we spoke of. Then you cross over the line into design control. So this is where your full-on software becomes, uh, comes into play. Um, the steps relative to feeding um, development from UX is that the prototype and the results of formative studies as they've been applied through some tool set would be ported into your development process. And there are many tools out there that do things, you know, everything, of course, from sort of uh, simple wireframes to something more elaborate that represents the end result and that may be um, uh, tracks uh, the navigation. You click here, it goes there, um, this is a screen that would come up, that sort of thing. Um, finally, if you, if you port your result from your formative studies in through these tools, you would then add the back-end software development that would bring it all together. Adding a bit more detail to that diagram, um, you can sort of see I've listed here um, and basically the uh, examples of each uh, phase of the process here and how they sort of uh, evolve as it flows through the process. Um, the key elements I'd like to point to is that as you're doing activities on the left-hand side, there's at least three categories of information that become very relevant to activities on the right-hand side. 
Um, and these are uh, first under the, if you look in the formative study square, there's a UX specification that comes out of that. After you've done the formative studies, you know your results, you now know the specifications for your UX. And these are things that will feed your software development team. Uh, the second thing would be a UI definition um, and summative criteria. So this is information that you need to know how to test uh, your product once it's done. And the fact that you've developed this way ahead of your uh, uh, mainline development process really shows that, that you, you were able to sort of set goals for yourself and meet those goals on the back end. And the last element I would point to is that all the documentation uh, that you would generate for activities on the left um, really becomes part of your HFE UE report, which can be part of your FDA submission as well. So circling back around and really sort of driving home um, the, the elements here that really accelerate your development. I really want to sort of frame this in the light of you're doing the work you're supposed to do with good UX design, doing it early, but it can also accelerate your development in three ways. And uh, so the key takeaways here are that basically doing the UX first, um, what that really gains you is that, is that the more the higher fidelity that that UX is created to, um, the fewer changes there are in the back end. Um, software development is replete with you know anecdotes about if you know what you want up front, you save yourself so much on the on the back end because you don't have changes that ripple through your system and just cascade into a heck of a lot of uh, rework. Um, so that UX first is probably the biggest thing you can do to impact your development schedule. Secondly, use tools in creating these, um, these, these prototypes that allow you to take uh, elements of that and make use of it on the back end. Largely what you want to get out of this is like your user interface design. Um, keeping things one-to-one -one as much as possible, not having to rework those elements accelerates you on the back end. And lastly, reuse documentation. So there's uh, information that guides your developers, there's information that guides your test team. And lastly, there's information that goes into your FDA submission. These are the main ways of accelerating development uh, with good UX practice. So I was uh, moving pretty quickly there, but hopefully um, partly uh, the, the main points of that message uh, came across clearly. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, Shana, thank you for this opportunity to present.